I am Rachel Vincent. I'm the Director of Operations at the Recur Center and welcome to Local Host. We're super excited to be here tonight and thank you all very much for joining us. We're excited to see so many familiar faces and so many new folks too. Uh, so if you're not familiar with us, the Recur Center is a community-driven educational retreat for programmers. We're currently based in Soho, just a few blocks away. And people come from across the country and around the world to spend one, six, or 12 weeks becoming better programmers together in a self-directed and highly collaborative environment. At RC, you have the opportunity to direct yourself, to pick projects that you find intrinsically motivating, and to spend your time learning the things you always wished you could. People come to RC from a wide range of backgrounds and skill levels and use their time here to learn and work on almost any kind of programming project you can think of, from apps to games to compilers to art to original research to building their own programming languages. Uh, so we're completely free to attend, and we run an integrated recruiting agency to help anyone in our community who's interested in considering a new job. If you enjoyed tonight's talk, please consider applying to RC. There's still time to apply to our batches starting on April 2nd. So quick note about how this talk will run. Andy is gonna speak for about 30 minutes, uh, after which we'll have a two minute break. During that break, you're welcome to leave or stretch a bit, and after the break, we'll have dedicated Q&A time. So please don't ask questions during the talk. There are a few reasons we have a separate Q&A. Uh, taking questions during the talk is disruptive, and having a break in between the talk and Q&A keeps the talk time boxed and allows folks to leave if they wish. We also find that having a dedicated time for questions leads to more equal audience participation and better discussions. So without further, further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Andrew Kelly. Andrew is an RC alum from our fall 2013 batch and currently works as a backend engineer at OkCupid. He's also been working on Zig, a new systems programming language that's designed for robustness, optimality, and clarity on nights and weekends for a few years now. Yeah. Uh, Zig is quite new, so version 0.2.0 was just released last week, and this is the first ever recorded public talk about it. So please join me in welcoming Andrew. Thanks. I'm going to switch mics here. Okay. Can everybody hear me here? All right. All right, well, I'm going to try and convince all of you that software should be perfect. There should be no bugs, no exceptions. It works every time. And, uh, you know, we're, we're programmers, so it seems like we could do that, right? <laughs> well, let's, maybe let's work with me here, you know? Let's, let's figure it out. So what are some ways that software can fail? Well, your hard drive can catch on fire. Uh, the universe can shoot a magic beam into your computer and flip a bit. Um, or a human can sit down and type a bug into the keyboard. Uh, the first two are out of scope, um, <laughs> but maybe we can try to write better software. Uh, so what, what is perfect software? Uh, I, I'm going to give you this definition. Maybe we can use this for the talk. Uh, so perfect software is code where uh, you define your set of inputs, and for every single possible input, the code produces the correct output. And you can probably imagine some pretty complicated input. Maybe it stretches across a time domain. Maybe it stretches across user input domain. But let's start with something dead simple. Here's some code. This is a C function. Uh, it's defined to take the Boolean not of its parameter. So all we have to do is given false, return true. Given true, return false. This is pretty clearly perfect software. So. At least, here's, you know, here's some code where we know there's no bugs, and we can all feel good about that. And let's, let's see how, you know, how soon we can go into the weeds here. How about this function? This is JavaScript. Uh, this function is defined to add two numbers together. Um, slightly more complicated than Boolean not. Are we still in perfect software territory? Sadly, not. So uh, I don't want to read this number out loud, but Here's two numbers you can put into this function, and you're going to get an answer that's off by two. So sadly, we have already exited the domain of perfect software. All right, let's switch languages. I'm gonna, we're going to write it in Python instead. So this, this is kind of like an audience test. Like, is this, is this correct? And we'll, I'll come back to it, but we're going to switch languages again. Okay, this is C++. 
this function is supposed to concatenate two strings. So we get a left-hand side, get a right-hand side, we join them together, that's what all this function is supposed to do. It's this perfect software. So if you try to concatenate two strings together, you might need more memory to put them somewhere. And if your computer is at memory capacity, that's actually going to throw an exception. In C++, it's standard bad alloc. Uh, now you might define, you might say, okay, that's fine, but I'm defining this function that in that situation it's going to throw this exception. In which case, okay, fine, this is, we can call this perfect software. But now we're going to have a really hard time using this function and the rest of our code base to try to make perfect software because it's not obvious when you're calling concat strings that it might throw this exception. So you might not realize that this is a possible output of your, of your code. So back to the Python code. It's the same problem. Uh, Python does solve the addition of integers problem, but uh, the way that they solve it is by using a big number library. And when you add two numbers together, you might get a really big number, you might have to allocate memory to put that big number in. So same problem. So let's talk about memory. I know it's, it's every programmer's least favorite topic. Overcommit. When your operating system wants to treat memory like an air airplane. So here's how this works. Here's our system. We have one unit of RAM, and we have two processes, and each process is gonna want to allocate one unit of RAM. So the system has half as much memory as it needs to satisfy these processes' desires. Here's what happens on a system with overcommit on. Uh, both processes call malloc, and the OS says, I got, your, I got your memory seats right here, why don't you just have this one and you can have this one, no problem. And the operating system has overcommitted, it's said it's had more memory than it actually has. So what happens is when the first process writes to the memory, the operating system says, okay, yep, I got your seat right here on the, on the memory plane, here you go. And then the next process tries to write to memory, and there's, there's no memory for that process to get. It, it's not gonna work. So what does it do? This is the part where the airline company would have to uh, start bribing people to give up their seats. Um, but an operating system does something even a little bit more sinister. That's where the oom killer comes into play. I like to think of the oom killer as the ski free monster that just goes down and gobbles up an innocent little process skiing down the hill. So what happens is that the oom killer has to kill a process. It says, not everyone can have memory, so I'm just gonna kill one of them, and then I'll just kill processes until we have enough memory. That's what it does. <laughs> so here's some C code that tries to allocate 10 megabytes. Um, here's what happens if you don't, if you're, if you're at memory capacity and you try to allocate this memory and you have overcommit off. Uh, just as you'd expect, malloc returns null, and you can print your little error message, you can do whatever you want. You can handle the situation. If you have overcommit on, you actually don't get null from malloc, you get memory. But then when you try to write to it, you get killed. You can't, you can't handle it. Or better, even worse, another process in your system will get killed. You, you don't even know which one, it's heuristics based. <laughs> so uh, overcommit is so problematic to trying to write perfect software that I'm gonna include it along with hard drive catching on fire and cosmic rays. It's it just, it's the pits. And you, uh, right, it, it's not just theoretical, so I'll give you a couple real world examples. I called a lift on my Android phone, I uh, switched apps to look at a map, it used too much memory, I don't know what process the killer killed, but my phone had to reboot, lift sent a new message, a new driver notification, and then I, I don't know, like, this guy wanted me to get in his car, he was like offering me candy, it was really weird. This is not perfect software. Okay, another example, I was building Clang in debug mode. I ran out of memory while I was linking. The oom killer didn't kill Clang, it killed the window manager, and I just lost everything I was doing. This is not perfect software. Like, this is not just theoretical. Uh, and also, like, some people say, oh, you know, but it, it, it's always on, so what do you do? You know, you just have to assume that it's on. But it's configurable in Linux, you can turn it off. Windows doesn't have it. Uh, also on most um, uh, like production grade server systems, you, you put a memory limit on the processes for best practice. That causes malloc to fail. 
And you know, other operating systems that are less popular, they also don't overcommit. So you, you have to assume memory allocation can fail. This is, this is a premise of programming if you want to write perfect software. So is this too much to ask for? Like, should we just give up and say, well, it's too hard. You know, we're just going to have bugs forever. It's, I, it's too much. No. Let's, come on, let's, let's step it up. There's, there's a difference between a bug where, okay, you made a mistake, but you can fix it, you know, you can make progress. There's a difference between that and just a fundamental limitation built into your language that you can never overcome. Uh, so let's, let's, with that assumption, let's, let's visit, uh, some more language stuff. Is there a problem with this JavaScript code? We're creating a generator. So if we think about memory, there's a hidden memory allocation here because calling counter is performing what's called a closure uh, over X and that has to put it on the heap. So that actually has a hidden memory allocation that can fail. And so if you ever use this um, closure feature of JavaScript, which is the main feature of JavaScript, <laughs> you can't handle that memory allocation failure in this language. And I, I picked on JavaScript, but this is a problem with Python, Ruby, Perl, PHP, Haskell, Lisp, Swift, Nim, and Go. They're all hopeless. They all have hidden memory allocations. You can't write perfect software in any of these languages. You're like, you're done. Like, hello world, done. <laughs> so what does that leave us with? Uh, well, pro languages that use exceptions, you know, we talked about standard bad alloc. You could handle exceptions. So Java, C Sharp, C++, D, those, those, you could do it. And C, where you can test the result of null. Now, while you technically could use exceptions to solve this problem, uh, I hope you can accept my argument that nobody really looks at exception-based code and says, like, oh, yeah, I've got everything covered. I I'm handling all the exceptions correctly. Like, pe people compile C++ with F no exceptions, and, like, you know, people write Java code where they just say catch everything and then, I don't know, print something and return null. Like, exception-based handling is not going not gonna to cut it. I'm going to cross that off the list. So, congratulations, we're back 45 years into the past with C to try to write perfect software. Like, come on, we can do better than this. So, this is why I'm here to talk to you about Zig. Uh, Zig is a new programming language, and uh, Zig cares about allocation failure, along with many other things. So, I'll give you some of the, some of the laundry list of features that Zig brings to the table. We actually compile faster than C, we produce faster machine code than C, but we still provide seamless interaction with C libraries. Uh, we have robust and ergonomic error handling that makes handling out of memory conditions seem kind of easy. We have compile time code execution and reflection. We have generics, async, await, via promises. Uh, we have no hidden control flow, no hidden memory allocations. We ship with a build system. We have out of the box cross compilation on any system for any system. Uh, that's a lot of stuff, so I'm just going to talk to you about this stuff uh, in the time that we have here. And uh, this is the part where I'm going to show you some code. So, um, you know, I'll start with what I was just talking to you all about with, um, with handling errors. So, um, I'll pull up a terminal here, and uh, let's take a look. Is, how's the font? Is it big enough? Bigger? Bigger and better? Yeah, 16 is as big as we're going to go. All right, so we're going to go to this little place where I have some code. All right, so this is kind of a hello world little situation here. Um, and I'll show you what this looks like. So we're just going to print some stuff to the screen here. Uh, let me talk to you about memory allocators. In most programming languages, you're going to have a default memory allocator. So calling new in C++ or just, you know, all the hidden stuff in the other programming languages. Um, in, in Zig, we have explicit memory allocators. Uh, this is useful for operating systems, video games, high performance uh, servers, things where you might want a little more control over what you're allocating. Um, and so here, I'm just going to pick one that's a pre-allocated 200 kilobyte block so that I can show you how it works. 
So here's one, global allocator. We're gonna give it, give me some, give me 100 integers. And then I'll just write to this little array here. Okay, so if I try to do this, I'm gonna get a compile error. Just to warn you, I know that seeing errors is traumatic. So there's an error. What happened? Well, we tried to allocate memory, but we didn't check for failure. So I need to catch the error. So here's one way to do that. I can do catch, catch the error. Let me just work on my thing here. Okay. So now I can do something like, mm, I can just say that there was a problem, and then I can return. So let's see what happens here. Oh, I missed a semicolon. Yeah, go figure. Okay. So that actually worked fine um, because we did allocate the memory we asked for and we were able to assign the answer, so no problem. But let me just kind of, let me just try to ask for a little too much. I'm pretty sure that this is more than 200 kilobytes. Oops. Oh, I just exited out of him. Okay. Okay, so now we printed our message and we got the error message out of memory. Uh, something that you might want to do pretty commonly is if you catch an error, you want to just return it from the function that you're already in. And so I can do that by saying, okay, now main can return an error, and this syntax means that it's going to infer the possible errors that it can return, and I can just say return e. Oh, oops, I exit out of them again. Okay. So this actually returned the out of memory error from main, and then, um, that gave us a little stack trace here that tells us what the problem was. So you can see that the memory allocator says out of memory, and then it got passed up the stack here, and then we returned it here. This is the code that we wrote. Um, this is pretty common, so there's a shortcut for this. I can actually just put the word try in front of the expression, uh, and then I can delete this catch clause. And so this is gonna be exactly the same thing. So you see this try word a lot in Zig, because a lot of things can fail. And what try does is it says, look, I understand you can fail, and um, why don't you just go ahead and make my function fail in the same way if you do, otherwise give me that value. So that's, that's one thing that Zig brings to the table. And uh, let me go into a bigger code base and just show you what that kind of looks like um, if I introduce some errors into, into a bigger code base. So I'm actually gonna uh, get out of this, and I'm gonna go down here. Okay, this is uh, the Zig code base itself, and I'm inside of one of the um, main allocators that we're gonna use for, the, for you know, running a build. And I'm gonna insert this block that I have commented out here. And this says, every time you allocate memory, one out of 255 chance, just make it fail. So I just turned that on, and I'm gonna run this, um, I'm gonna run the build scripts. So this is for sure not gonna work. Okay, it crashed. Um, and this is actually a non-deterministic demo, so I'm, I'm, I haven't seen this one before. So here's what happened. Um, we got two diagnostic pieces of information here. Um, this is the line of code that actually failed, and um, what happened is, you can see this error, attempt to unwrap error out of memory. So what happened is that this code here used cache, which we looked at before, but instead of providing a block and handling the problem, um, this code says unreachable, and that's a promise to the compiler that you won't get here. But since we compiled this in debug mode, the compiler says, okay, well, you told me it wouldn't get here, but I got there, so that's a problem. Uh, and so what it said is it printed a stack trace from here down, so this is, this is how we got from main to this function, and it also printed an error return trace from here up, and that's how the error got to the part where we're catching it and saying that we couldn't possibly have an error. So here's where it was originally returned. Here's where it was returned from this function, returned from this function, returned from this function, finally until we tried to catch it and promised there wouldn't be a problem. So I wouldn't have to pop over to debugger. I could just go fix, like I just know where the problem is and I can go fix it. Namely, it's just at the top right now and it's this code that I inserted. Let me just comment that back out. <laughs> Don't want that in my compiler. Okay, 
So that's a little kind of whirlwind intro into error handling. Um, there's more, but I want to show you off some other cool things. So let me let me go on. Okay, I know that I, some people might feel like I buried the lead here, and I said that uh, Zig produces faster machine code than C. And you might be thinking you're insane because the way that languages measure their speed is as a fraction of how fast C is. Um, and I'm telling you that it's an improper fraction. So, <laughs> so let's have a little look. <laughs> um, so a contributor to Zig uh, named uh, Mark uh, Tyus went, over, went ahead and implemented some crypto functions. So I will show you his SHA-256 implementation that he made for Zig. Um, if I understand correctly, what he did was he went over to the internet and he searched for what's the fastest possible um, SHA-256 implementation, and he found this Intel PDF and then thought, eh, there's no code there. And then he found this thing, which is this person experimenting with writing C and then later hand rolling some x86-64. So he kind of used this as inspiration uh, and then wrote his uh, Zig implementation. So I went ahead and download, sorry, I went ahead and downloaded the C code and the assembly code, and, and I'll just run it on my computer here for you. Um, and I'm plugged into power, so hopefully our, our CPU doesn't power down. Um, so here's our files here. Uh, I made myself a little text file so I could remember. Okay, so here's this, you know, this person's C code that's top of the search results. Um, let's just run this. Okay, this says that the, the implementation is 180 megabytes a second to do SHA-256. And then if you read this blog post, this guy says, okay, cool, and then I read the output of the assembly and I thought I could fix it by hand rolling some x86. Um, so let's just run that code. All right, so this isn't even C, this is like hand rolled assembly. All right, good job, you made it a little bit faster, 192. Um, okay, and then, so Mark went off and made his uh, Zig implementation, so I'll just run that one. Luckily, I, I disabled the, um, Allocation failure <laughs> code. <laughs> All right. There we go. Um, let's run that. So I, he just had it collecting data for longer. So 205 megabytes a second, um, that is... 14% faster than this. Uh, I, I went ahead and tried to look at the assembly to figure out what's different. Um, I eliminated LTO, it's not LTO. Um, I, I just, I looked at some of the assembly difference and I noticed that um, the Zig generated code, even though one of them's Clang, one of them's Zig, both of them are using the same LLVM as the backend. One of them was using this <laughs> ROX code from that PDF that I skipped over and the other one isn't, and I think maybe that's it. Um, uh, but I re what it really comes down to is that if you look at the um, if you look at the the Zig implementation of SHA-256, Mark used this feature of Zig called comp time, and that's where you can run uh, expressions at compile time. So this variable um, initializes this array, this, and all of this happens at compile time. And then down here, uh, this for loop is inlined, which is another compile time concept. And so that makes this R value known at compile time. And so Zig actually unrolls all of this. And I think that's what kind of helped um, LLVM figure out to use the, uh, the ROX um, code. Um, so, you know, we can, uh, I can talk about the <coughs> theoretical reasons like why Zig produces better uh, LLVM IR than Clang does, and there are some. Um, but bottom line is, I just I just demoed a real world crypto algorithm that benches faster. You know, it's, it's gotta go fast. Um, so okay, I just mentioned some compile time stuff. Uh, I want to show you how that works. So I have a very I have a short demo for that one. Um, let me let me pull it up. So th this is this is a really short uh, Zig program. Um, it's actually not even a complete program. It's just kind of a library. So we have a function that returns the first n primes, and we just have a function that sums a list of numbers. 
Uh, and then we, at compile time, just assert that the answer is 1060. And so I can, um, I can compile this. And it works fine. It produces a O file. You know, we could use this to link or do whatever. But the interesting thing to note here is that these functions are actually not generated because we don't call them, at least not at runtime. We call them here at compile time. So um, this O file, it, it's just generated with these, with these global constants with the answers of calling these functions at compile time. Like, none of this runs at runtime. And I can prove this to you by changing this number to be wrong and then trying to compile it. It won't compile. <laughs> this assertion failure. I mean, just fix that and builds. So, yeah, I mean, it really is just running at compile time. So, like, really, is it? Well, like, what happens if I like take out the the while loop condition? This will be an infinite loop. Error. Uh, we tried to figure out the answer for a thousand iterations and didn't come up with an answer. I got your turning problem right, your, your halting problem right here. Uh, and you can actually just adjust this number. If you need more iterations, there's a, com there's a function you can just call at compile time to say, give me a little more iterations. Um, so that, that's, that's what comp time does. Um, and let's, um, let's go on. Uh, all right, I want to show you about how you can still use all your C code. So here's a fun little example. Um, I have a little Tetris game. And I'm going to run sig build play. All right, we got ourselves some Tetris. So this is actually using OpenGL, like the C library. This, and it's using libpng, uh, and it's using glfw for the window. Um, and I'm not going to play a whole game of Tetris. But, you know, a lot of times if you're, if you're in some other language and you want to use some C code, you're going to have to write a whole wrapper to try and use all that code. Um, so, like, for example, let me just show you the binary here. You know, we're using all, we're pulling on all this stuff. Usually you're going to see a wrapper for everything. Um, here's what it looks like in Zig. Uh, we actually just import the H files directly. Um, and then you can just use them. So here's, for example, like some shader code. Um, here we're using the gl int type. Here we're using gl get attribute location. Here we're using gl get uniform location. Like you can just call all the C functions and it all works fine. Um, uh, we even understand a lot of macros, like pound defines. Um, not everything, because there's macros are a little too powerful, but the stuff that makes sense, we support. Uh, so you don't have to give up C. You can still use it. Uh, and it goes the other way, too. You can create zig libraries that export H files that you can then call from C. Um, all right. And then finally, I'm, I'm really excited to show you this one. Uh, zig lets you build code on any of the supported targets for any of the supported targets. So um, what I have here to show you is a operating system made by an RC alum, Andrea. Uh, it's a microkernel. Um, it supports threading and interprocess communication. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build it on this laptop, and then I'm going to run it inside Kimu, emulating hardware. And then I'm going to build a user land program on this laptop, cross-compiling it for this OS, and then run it inside the OS. Okay, so here's, we can just run the zig build script. I'll go ahead and turn on verbose so you can see it working. Okay, there it is, it's running. Oh, it's, oh, my terminal not big enough? Oh, the font size is a problem. Okay, I'm actually gonna make this smaller so we can see. I think it's reasonable to uh, to want to have um, 80 by 25, uh, 14. Okay. okay, let's try that again. Okay, so here we are. This is Zen operating system. Let's see what we can do here. Okay, we got some commands. Looks like scrolling works. Clear the screen. What kind of programs do we have? 
guest number. Okay. It's actually a user land program. And this is the uh, guest number example from Zig, running it in, um, running it in Zen. Let's see. Which one should I guess next? 66? 69, dude. I think it's 65. Okay. I win. Um, okay. So that's, so right now we can see, oops. Guest number is the only program. I'm going to quit out of this. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to make a new one. Um, yeah. Right now I'm going to copy the hello world example from Zig directly from the source git and copy it in there. And then, um, Andrea made the build script, um, pick up, uh, user land programs in this folder and put it in the ISO so that it'll get picked up. So if I build it again, one of these outputs is building that program. And if I do ls, you can see our user land program here. And it totally works. So that, that is the same Zig source code that will work on Linux, it will work on Windows, it will work on Mac OS, and it will work on Zen OS. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. So um, that's the demos I wanted to show you. Now I just want to tell you a little bit about the community of Zig and why maybe you might have a good time joining. Um, we have seven active members, like giving helpful like feedback to pull requests, submerging code, writing code. Um, we just released a new beta uh, last week, so it's a good time to to jump in. Documentation's lacking, but we got a lot. Of, you know, we're a lot missing, but we have a lot. Um, the, the chat room on Freenode's got about 35 people in it. We're all friendly. I banned the one hater. Um, uh, Jeff Fowler, our C alum, wrote this blog post, How Zig Do. Uh, it's a great little tutorial. Um, how to, how to make a, a, a brain, am I allowed to say F word? No. It, it, it does the, the brain F, uh, programming language. <laughs> um, and then one more thing, uh, I am on Patreon. I'm trying to make this a sustainable project that I can work on full time. So if you feel charitable, maybe you can have a little look. Uh, and then uh, that's it. I'll, I'll take a little break and we'll do some QA. Hi. So um, you said Zig um, has no implicit allocation. Uh, but I noticed it has function calls. Uh, do function calls allocate on the stack? And what happens if the stack overflows? Great question. Uh, this is an unsolved problem so far, but there's a plan to solve it, which is static call graph analysis. Um, the idea is to, at compile time, figure out how many bytes necessary for the entire stack and insert into the ELF file um, or, you know, Windows cough file the correct number of stack bytes that we need. The OS gives it to us, and you're guaranteed to never overflow the stack. There are problems with this, such as uh, pointer um, function pointers, um, coroutines make it tricky, uh, external function calls, and I have plans to solve all of them. And it's complicated, but important. And let's talk later. Um, so one thing that C does really well is that uh, it's very good for if you have a bunch of syscalls and you want to like call the syscalls and do some simple logic around the outputs of them. Uh, does Zig have a, is Zig good for this use case? Um, I want to ask you a clarifying question. Are you talking about using the preprocessor? Um, no, I'm just, like, I think C is very, like, no, I'm not talking about using this preprocessor. Just, like, if you want to call some syscalls and, like, do some simple... Yeah, let me, let me actually show you how the standard library works in a small way. Um, luckily, I have the standard library code right here. So we have uh, Linux, and then we have Linux for the various architectures. And then this is kind of how Muscle is structured, which I've like, ported most of the code. But like, here's some of the Linux compatibility layers. Um, so there's the familiar like dupe 2, here's XXVE. You can see we're doing this like arch syscall 3 thing. And then that's just, um, that's just these. So you can see we have inline assembly. Is that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We've talked a lot about 
um, memory management and memory allocation. Uh, how does that actually work in Zig? Is there a garbage collector? Are there lifetimes? Uh, there's no lifetimes. There's no garbage collector. Uh, what we have is a standard library defined allocator struct that um, the language doesn't know about, but it's kind of important to the standard library. Um, so if you fulfill this struct, in other words, if you provide a function pointer here, a function pointer here, and a function pointer here, then this gives you all these methods like allocate, you know, with a with a type parameter and all that stuff. So what we have is an allocator interface, albeit an struct, because we don't have any actual uh, virtual um, dispatch features. Um, and just every standard library function that might allocate accepts an allocator as a first parameter. And that's just something you have to type, you know, that's the boilerplate you type out in Zig, passing allocators. Uh, manual memory management. Um, what I didn't talk about is the defer keyword. So whenever you allocate a resource, you're usually going to type the word defer after it or error defer after it, depending on if you want to clean it up unconditionally or if you want to clean it up on error exit. Um, yeah, topic for later, I suppose. Is there right there? Is there any? Are there any particular features of Zig that you would be you'd consider? Uh, as something that it brings new to the table in terms of game development specifically? Uh, here's one. Uh, for Windows, you can cross on, uh, you can create a binary that just has no dependencies at all. Like we're talking kernel32.dll and that's it. Um, that's pretty great for distribution. Uh, and you can create that on Linux or on Mac. Uh, if Windows is your home platform, the equivalent is true for distributing to Linux. Uh, so I have met a lot of programmers that end up writing code uh, or programs to scratch their own itch. There is some kind of problem they're trying to solve or a problem domain that they're working in. Is there a particular problem that you were trying to solve or problem domain that you were working in where you realized C was not working or available language was not working and ended up coming up with Zig? Yeah. Uh, I was working on a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, music studio, peer-to-peer -peer open source music studio, and uh, just having a lot of trouble with concurrency and um, performance and tooling. Uh, and it's also really hard. So uh, I took a break to write a compiler because that's way easier than writing a peer-to-peer -peer music studio. Hi. Uh, you showed us an example of handling uh, an out of memory error by trying to al allocate an obscene amount of memory. Um, but then you know, it occurs to me, an out of memory error can also happen when basically you're pushing right against the system limits and so you can allocate a very small amount of memory. But to handle that, mem uh, that out of memory error and gracefully exit the program, you had to generate a stack trace and generate a lot of string descriptions uh, of what went wrong. What happens if there's an out of memory error while you're doing that handling of the out of memory error? That's a great question. Um, so what I didn't show you was just handling memory error gracefully and then continuing execution. Um, and that's, that's an important feature of what Zig lets you do is what I didn't show you. So um, what you need to do is use that catch keyword that I showed you uh, and then um, atomically back out of the operation that you're doing. So for example, um, if you're a web server and you run out of memory, uh, maybe you serve a 500 error to the current um, connection and then close the connection and then you know and end, end that request so you could you could then be a um, be a web server just running at full capacity I mean just go ahead throw as many requests as that you as you can some of them are 500 all the other ones will run with the exact same latency and without failing uh, I'm gonna have a proof of concept of this soon couldn't get it done in time for the talk but it's going to be uh, it's going to be a proof of concept of multiplexing thread pools onto coroutines, handling like memory uh, allocation, like full memory system usage correctly. So I promise that that will be done soon. What is your criteria for whether or not a piece of code can go in the standard library? Uh, great question. Um, if it has tests and 
I feel like it's good. <laughs> um, more seriously, uh, I have I, I made this thing called the Zen of Zig uh, because I was inspired by Python, and I'll pull it up. There's there's a couple things there. Um, it's at the bottom of the documentation here. Uh, I'll blow it up a little bit. Oh, that's a lot of work for Firefox. Okay. Uh, the one that I'm thinking of right now is incremental improvements and avoid local maximums and edge cases matter. So as long as the code at least recognizes the edge cases that it's not handling, doesn't, um, doesn't go backwards and doesn't go up the wrong slope, then it's good for the standard library. Helping with that is the fact that we have uh, lazy top-level declarations. So if you don't call a piece of code, it doesn't even get analyzed. Uh, so if you want to just say, you know, if operating system is this other one that we've never heard of before, do all this stuff, that's fine. That code's not going to mess with Linux or anything. So, kind of a bunch of disparate answers to your question, but hopefully that gives you the idea. Hey Andrew, uh, what's the language's uh, what's the language's opinion on recursion? Uh, recursion, that's a great question. Um, I don't remember what your name is over here, but you were asking about um, Stack Overflow. Uh, recursion is one of the enemies of uh, static call graph, um, static maximum stack size knowledge. So it's actually better if you can avoid recursion. Um, if you avoid recursion, that's just one less way that your code can break. Um, in the future, I am considering providing a way to annotate recursion so that the compiler can um, check your work and make and understand what the stack requirements will be, um, or potentially require recur um, make recursion have to be able to fail. Like you try to call a recursive function and it might just not work because you're out of stack space. I don't know. Um, that's to be figured out, but uh, that's a great question because recursion is one of the enemies of perfect software. Um, is there uh, any specific support for, actually, how does documentation work? Is there tooling or like inline comments turned into documentation? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I am inspired by Rust doc. I think Rust docs are really good. Um, I'm, I have plans for a ZigDoc. Uh, I don't want to do it in the C++ compiler. I only want to do it in the self-hosted compiler because that sounds way more fun. Um, so these docs here are special because they're the language docs. Um, these are generated by a Zig program and all this code is tested. But for library documentation, um, the syntax supports doc comments. It's planned to have um, ZigDoc, work, ZigDoc work, but it's pending a uh, self-hosted compiler being more complete. So far, it tokenizes and parses a subset and does no, anal no analysis. That's, that's the progress on the self-hosted compiler. As soon as that happens, though, we're going to have great docs. Hey, um, I may not have been paying attention, but it seems like Rust was conspicuously absent from all of your language comparisons, and I was wondering why that Oh, that's a great case. question. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this, the scoop on Rust, as far as memory allocation goes, um, uh, it, it used to be that the, the standard library would panic on allocation failure. Um, I don't know where this is in like the nightly or releases are stable, but they added some functions to all the containers uh, to try to mitigate this. So you can um, you can kind of like reserve memory, and then it's the, ne the next, you know, like if you have a list, you can say like, oh, reserve, you know, 20 spaces. And now the next 20 like appends won't fail. Um, so, so two answers. One, it used to be that the standard library disqualified itself from being used. The core stuff is fine. The language is fine. Now they've added stuff to the standard library that's, I don't know, it's kind of like an afterthought. It's kind of like bike lanes in New York City. Uh, <laughs> but it does the job, you know? Like you can write perfect software in Rust. Um, Rust is a, is a great competitor to Zig. I think Rust is like the main competitor to Zig. That's all I'm going to say about that. 
Shout out to Steve Klabnik. <laughs> I saw on your like list of philosophy bullet points, you had favor reading over writing. I'm wondering if there's any features or aspects of Zig that actually encourage reading code over writing code beyond the bullet. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, one, one of the, the biggest things is that I, I have to say no a lot to features that people, sometimes even myself, want. Um, people love inventing features for programming languages. If you make a programming language, you will have a bajillion people telling you all the new features you should be adding. Um, and and even some good ones. And uh, the biggest thing that I do for reading code is I just I just don't have a lot of features. So we have kind of the benefit of C minus the preprocessor, where you you know it's just structs and function calls and not much else. Um, and that's that's what favors reading code. Um, in in a lot of the design decisions. People, people want syntax shortcuts, and I say, mm, we need consistency. We need fewer constructs, and sometimes you have to type a little more when you're writing code, but that, uh, that consistency can really help the person reading the code. So I don't have a, like a direct, you know, like gold star thing to show you, but it's kind of like, um, you know, it's in all the things I didn't do. Hi. Uh, over here, yeah. <laughs> um, I have never even considered writing a language myself, but I'm curious about what the process was when you wrote it as far as like things that surprised you that maybe you didn't think of or, or something that you were just thinking was going to be a whole lot easier than it was to implement and then it was actually turned out to be super difficult because that is something that happens to me all the time. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, what what is something that in the, in the writing a programming language turned out to be much harder than anticipated? Hmm. It's really hard to just make progress on anything. Like I, I <laughs> <laughs> it feels like I can just work all day and just have almost nothing to show for it. Um, my girlfriend's here in the back, Allie, and she can vouch for how many weekends were the weekend I was going to launch 0 0.1.0. <laughs> it was more than two. Uh, hi. Um, Hello. So does Zig have, on the subject of features, <laughs> uh, does Zig have some types? Uh, what Rust calls enum types? Uh, yes, um, Zig calls those unions, and um, what you can, I wonder if I have it in the docs, that'd be pretty cool. Oh, I did document it. <laughs> um, so what we have, I'll, I'll push control plus here. Okay, ooh. Um, so unions in C uh, are where you can have them be one of many types. And what Zig lets you do is, um, you can actually pass a um, enum type into the kind of like the union keyword, and that gives you uh, a tag, and then you can then find out the tag and switch on it and do all that stuff. You can also just infer the enum type. So if you do union parentheses enum, then um, you you get the Rust thing that you're talking about, and you can uh, you can switch on it like this. You get the value and um, you know, all that stuff. Also, uh, the normal union here, um, if you, it actually generates with a secret tag value um, that you're not allowed to look at, but it'll still cause your program to crash if you do it wrong. So we actually have union safety at runtime. Um, of course, if you need to interact with C, then you need to put the extern keyword here and then you lose that safety. Short answer is yes. I'm interested in knowing when you've decided to implement a new feature, you've decided on it, do you 
think about how it's been implemented in other languages, or do you tend to go at it from scratch? What's your process like? Um, I I put an issue proposal on GitHub, and um, in the early stages of Zig, I just get ignored by the world at large for a long time, and then just go do it, and then nobody cares. Um, lately, there's actually some people that care, so um, now I make a proposal on GitHub, and I get a bunch of great feedback, and I really appreciate it. Uh, but uh, another answer to your question is, I've never been really good at like reading papers and academic stuff. So um, I mostly just call up my friend Josh, and then I ask him if it's a good idea. And he tells me, almost. And then he like helps me figure out the idea. And then I go type it up. And then I give him another phone call the next day. And I say, hey, I tried to code our idea. It didn't work. And he goes, oh, yeah, OK. And then he gives me the next iteration. And then I just go code it up again. And eventually, we get it right. Um, so outside of the core compiler, um, what additions to the Zig ecosystem do you think would be most helpful at this point? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I actually have a little kind of like wanted ad, um, which I can pull up here. Because uh, I thought about this. Okay. All right, I want Windows developers to make games and help me with uh, stack traces for Windows. Um, I want iOS developers to figure out if it's going to be good for iOS. I want Android developers to help me get it working on Android. I want web developers to help me figure out the WebAssembly story. Uh, I want embedded developers to uh, help me like make sure all the cross-compiling stuff's going, working. Um, actually, I've had a couple of those. So I can maybe get rid of this one. Uh, and I want game developers to um, like mostly just like write libraries and like figure out all the game developer stuff. Does that answer your question? So you mentioned uh, the extern keyword. What's the C ABI compatibility story? Oh, OK. Um, yeah. There's some keywords that are related to this. So all of the like main types, like struct, enum, uh, struct and union, I think is it, actually. and Functions. If you put extern in front of them, that they get, they just get the C ABI. There's bugs. The C ABI is complicated, and LLVM does not do the C ABI for you. Uh, so, like, there are bugs, but it mostly works. Um, and it at least is like, does it's at least is supposed to work. So you're allowed to file a bug if it doesn't work. Uh, and that's it. We actually have a um, translate C feature that I didn't even think to demo, but um, we can actually just translate almost any C code into Zig from like syntax to syntax, and the types all work fine. We have time for one more. Um, so I was just curious about what you think about like coding style for Zig, and if there is like a linter, or if the compiler enforces a particular coding style, or what, because it seems like pretty much what I've been seeing on the screen like looks pretty nice to look at. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, I did. I did put like some recommendations in the docs. Like, uh, let's see, style guide. Um, but they're not enforced. Um, I figure if people want to have a reference that's authoritative, they can look here. If they don't, I, I don't really care. Um, what I did do though is I made ta hard tabs a compiler. Just went ahead and did that. <laughs> Uh, we're going to have Zig format, just like Go format. Go format's great. Um, I think it will have no configuration options. Cool. I think that's all the time that we have for questions. Thanks. Thank you, Andy.